Good morning, everyone. We are Life Size. We are champions of the clean tech industry. We believe in its potential to tackle the greatest challenges of our time. And for the last 10 years, we've been using communications to help build market leading clean tech companies across Europe. So as we get started, just to help us get to know each other, it would be great if you could use the Q&A uh, function that you'll see, see within Zoom, just to say hello to us, let us know where you are and what the weather is today. So we'll get started. Uh, hopefully you can also see the video of us now. So hi, I'm Alyssa. I'm the CEO and founder of LifeSize. I'm Adam Brady. I'm the head of campaigns here in our UK office. And we're also joined by our colleague Lucy, who is going to be behind the camera today and is going to be helping us with the Q&A. Um, so I think we've actually can see one coming through here. Thank you, David, in Liverpool, who can confirm that it is wet in Liverpool. I think we're seeing quite a lot of that. Uh, yeah. Right now, we've got actually a little bit of glimmer of sunshine. Uh, we're coming to you today from our office in Shoreditch, London. And uh, it's touch and go. It's touch and go. And yeah. by all means, we're, uh, by all reports, we're going to be having a lot of rain <laughs> later. I can also see, uh, hello, Warren in uh, Newcastle and uh, Anna in York, who is also having some wet weather today. I think that's a bit the theme, certainly here in the UK at the moment. So those are fantastic. Keep those coming. It's great to know that the chat function is <laughs> working and we'll continue to say hellos um, as we do our introduction here. So uh, just to start, uh, so to make sure that we're all on the same page, um, I just want to define what we mean by clean tech landscape. So um, uh, about a month ago, Alyssa and I went to a conference where we heard someone talk about how clean tech isn't actually an industry or a sector. It's more of a theme and we think that really resonates with us. Um, essentially that means that uh, if you're in a certain sector, we can use this theme, and that's where we focus our communications. It's all within this clean tech theme. So if you find yourself in one of the sectors listed below, from energy storage and generation to bioeconomy, you are in the right place. Um, all the communications we do is focused within that, um, in those sectors, but with the theme of clean tech. And I think what's particularly interesting about this landscape is that the challenges that companies face in this landscape are very similar, whether you're in electromobility or uh, internet of energy. Um, we, what we find is that the growth path looks very similar for companies within this landscape. And of course, one of those key challenges is communications. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about how you need to evolve and progress your marketing in order to um, keep up with and continue to support and accelerate your commercial growth. So that is going to be our theme for today. We are talking about grown-up marketing or, oops, excuse me, clean tech companies. Um, just before we get into that, uh, just a hello to Emma, who is in Berlin. I was there last week and the weather was absolutely gorgeous, quite different to what we're having here. She says it's cloudy, hot and bright uh, there in Berlin, but they are expecting some thunderstorms tonight. New career as a weather person. <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, we can move on from the weather reports, but uh, it's, it's great to see all those messages coming in. Thank you. Um, and on this note, we're just going to turn off our videos for the time being so you can focus on the pure marketing content, uh, but we'll come back on for the Q&A later. Right. So um, I'm just going to go through a bit of an agenda. So first, what we'll do, we're going to be covering a range of topics, uh, talking about why uh, changing clean tech marketplace requires a grown-up approach to marketing, um, and how industry momentum has impacted what successful communications look like, and what that means for aspirational companies and their marketing efforts. Next, we'll go through a few approaches to grown-up marketing, from wide, broad company strategy through to incisive and focused social media planning. Then we're gonna take you through a few real life examples that we've worked on with some current clients. And finally, we'll end with some conclusive thoughts and a Q and A. Oh, sorry, technical issues. Anyway, a bit of housekeeping before we actually begin. If you're joining us live and have any questions throughout the webinar, as Alyssa said, please uh, punch them into the Q and A and or chat function. Um, we may um, answer them on the spot if they're relevant at the time. If not, we'll come to them uh, at the end. And um, if you need to leave before we can answer any of your questions, feel free to tweet us at Life Size Media or find us on LinkedIn, the same name, or you can email, email mail at lifesizemedia.com. Right, are we ready? I think we are. Let's go.
Okay, so I want to start by setting some context for the topic for today's webinar. Why are we talking about growing up? So here you can see a photo of me, uh, I guess four years ago now, at Eco Summit London uh, 2015. Um, and, and back at that event, um, I gave one of my first uh, Eco Summit speeches and I called on clean tech companies to take communication seriously. Um, I simply wanted them to put it on the priority list. I think my call to arms was, uh, please just start doing this. Um, I believe, um, I have always believed, I continue to believe that you cannot be successful in business without effective communications. Nearly five years later, I think that call to arms has changed somewhat. Today we see that clean tech companies do in fact take comms seriously. In fact, I'd argue that the ones that don't, didn't take it seriously in the past are perhaps the ones that haven't survived today. Almost every company we work with now has someone in an internal marketing role, and that certainly wasn't the case when we started out. And many of them are willing to make a healthy investment into marketing. So what's the problem? The problem then, and the reason that we chose grown-up marketing as our subject today, is that clean tech companies have a tendency to make a marketing hire, put a line item in the budget, and then simply breathe a sigh of relief that they've ticked that box and they don't have to think about it anymore. I really don't mean to be disrespectful. I love clean tech founders, but I do think that many of them just simply don't want to have to focus on the marketing piece. They understand that they need to do it, but what they really want is to push the trigger and let it take care of itself. So as a consequence, the vast majority of marketing in the clean tech, clean tech space is not even close to good enough. What we're seeing is a lot of off the shelf, cookie cutting, cutter marketing, and it's a case of just simply things ticking over. So what you see is that the company starts to grow, the technology develops, the market matures, but if the marketing continues to be overlooked, at some point it is going to start holding that growth back. And then what we find is that suddenly companies realize that the biggest thing holding them back from achieving their goals is the quality of the communications. And that's often the point when they come and start talking to us. But I hope that by sharing some of our experiences with you here today and talking through some of the key approaches to grown up marketing, we can make sure that your marketing is directly contributing to your commercial success long before it gets to that crunch point. Right, so first we're going to look at this changing marketplace. Yes, yeah, so to set the context um, for grown-up marketing, I think there are two uh, key themes that are happening here. And the first is momentum in the clean tech space. So in the last year or so, we have seen significant uh, momentum in this space. I think it's really more than we've ever seen before. Um, here's a, a really fantastic figure from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So in the last year, global venture, global venture capital and private equity investment jumped 127% to 9.2 US uh, billion dollars. That's the highest that we've seen since 2010. At the same time, oil majors and other big corporates are starting to make very serious moves into the clean tech space. Of course, one of the key examples that we've seen of that in recent times is Shell's acquisition of Sonnen. I think that has been extremely important in creating a sort of um, an idea of what is possible for companies that are growing in this space. And it's also kind of set a new standard for what, uh, for what commercial success can look like uh, within this landscape. As a background to that, I think we're also finding that corporates have really accepted that they can't meet their sustainable and carbon commitments without genuine cooperation with startups. What we're finding from our personal experience is that our clean tech clients today are now typically raising series B or C funding. Uh, we're seeing tickets between maybe 10 and $30 million and that a lot of our clients are now at the stage where they're even looking towards an IPO or an exit. Also today, we find that clean tech companies really have the opportunity to, global, to go global. In fact, I would argue that perhaps you can't really expect to compete as a clean tech company unless you are prepared to go global. And um, of course, news in from last night, with the UK committing to net zero emissions by 2050, Whatever the viewpoint of that is, it does mean that big business and government are going to have to invest in clean technology in the coming years. So it's only going to proliferate further um, into the market. So in summary, there is opportunity in this space greater than we've ever seen before. 
But at the same time, it also means that the bar has been set substantially higher. So what's happening on the marketing side of things? Marketing is changing, and I'm not saying that just because it suits marketing professionals like us to say so, but we have this strange paradox to confront today, which is that marketing is both easier and harder than it ever has been before. We're seeing that themes that have been kind of bubbling in the background for the last few years are really starting to take prominence. I'm gonna look at three of those in particular. So number one, the not quite death of the press release. Um, I'll explain all of these in more detail in the next slide. Number two, the incredible ease of producing content. And number three, the rise and rise of content marketing. So let's take a look at all of those in more detail. What do these themes mean for your marketing? Well, the first thing to say is that it is increasingly difficult to get high quality media attention. Of course, PR work remains critical, and when it works, it delivers more short-term impact than really any other approach that you can take. But getting it takes more and more work, and the reality is that the vast majority of press releases are simply falling into the abyss. I think it's hard for a lot of us to accept this, both as PR professionals and as companies that have relied on PR work, but the feedback that we're getting from journalists is that they simply aren't reading most press releases. We are also finding that particularly uh, journalists that are writing long form in-depth articles simply do not accept press releases. So things are really starting to change in that space. The second point I mentioned was the incredible ease of producing content. It's easier than ever, when I said it, it, that marketing is easier than ever, this is because the barriers to entry have never been lower. So you can pay for news wires, you can commission blogs at low cost, and anyone can tweet. But the result of all of that ease is what I might like to call communication saturation and an awful lot of white noise. I think this is particularly true, and we've all experienced this on social media. So pretty much every company now realizes that they, quote, have to be on social media, but most really don't know what it is that they want to say when they get there. So this means that most social media work is in fact making zero contribution towards your commercial goals. It's just taking up time and resource. And the third point was about uh, content marketing. So I think I find this personally an annoying and misunderstood term, but this is really where I want to draw your attention and where some of our case studies will focus because done right, content marketing puts the conversation back in your own hands and it allows you to build an audience that will deliver value for the long term. So that um, all probably sounds like quite a lot um, and uh, hopefully it's not too scary. But anyway, the point is we're here to help and we've got three ways in which you can reach this adulthood. Um, so, uh, number one, let go of what no longer serves you. Okay, let's get into it. So, in the early days, being visible and vocal is crucial. Communications can play an important role in building credibility before you're in the position where you're able to demonstrate your credibility through things like projects on the ground, revenue, technical data, and so on. But those same activities that work for you in the early days may not work for you as you continue to grow. In fact, they can start holding you back. So one of the examples here is award entries. So in the early days, we all, like, we all like awards, it makes, it makes us all feel good, but they can also be excellent at drawing attention from stakeholders and creating some buzz around you in the market. But as your company develops, chasing those same awards can start to look immature and unfocused, particularly if they're the same types of awards that you were winning maybe five years ago. I think the reason that we keep pushing for things like awards is because these are marketing activities that we know, we understand, and we feel comfortable. They've worked for us in the past, and so we just assume that they're gonna keep working for us in the future. So the same is true for some of these other tools that we've mentioned here, like uh, sending your news out via news wires, announcing every minor development of your company, and using so social aggregation tools that do cross-posting across different social media channels. It's understandable that you'll expect this to keep working for you, but as, t as things move forward, they won't. The same is true about the story that you're telling about yourself and your visual identity. It's very easy to assume that the audi your audience sees you the way that you do. You've developed, you've grown up, you um, have moved on as a company, but very often that understanding is really 
in your head, it's inside your company and it's not what the market is seeing because it's not the story that's coming across in your marketing. And I think we can uh, speak from personal experience where you say how easy it is to fall into that trap. Yes, I mean, we, uh, as you may have noticed, we rebranded recently and we had to go through these exact things ourselves. And um, now that we have rebranded, got a different message that we're putting out there, it's absolutely helped us focus our marketing strategy as well. It all comes at the same time. So consider whether your visual identity reflects your future or your past. Finally, I think the summary here is just try not to allow sentimentality to stand in the way of what is effective. This can be really hard. I mean, I, I speak from personal experience. As part of this rebrand, we, um, we redeveloped our whole marketing strategy. And it was really difficult to let go of some tools like Facebook that, frankly, we felt a lot of affection for and had been really important for us in the early days, but just really weren't a priority anymore. They were just starting to become a bit of a suck on resources. It can be really hard to let those things go, but it's really essential that you do. Okay, so moving on, number two, uh, invest in effective strategy. Okay, this is for me the most important thing that we will cover in the webinar today, so feel free to get your pencils out. Um, frankly, it astonishes me that a company at a certain stage of maturity finds it acceptable to have no written communication strategy. And I want to be completely clear, if your communication strategy isn't written down, you don't have a communication strategy. If that is true of you, do not worry, you are not alone. In fact, to date, no company that we have started working with has had a written strategy before we've come along. Um, but it's time for that to change. If you think about it, you wouldn't allow this in any other area of your business. So no company, or I mean, if this is true of you, then you have other problems, but no company gets to 5, 10, 15 years into their development without a written business plan. Most at a certain stage will have a written sales plan. But for some reason, when it comes to marketing, the approach seems to be, uh, guys, are we on Twitter? Yes. How many press releases are we sending? Great. And that's considered a strategy. As you grow, you will spend more and more on marketing. And this is another area where strategy is essential because strategy ensures that every penny is focused on a clear commercial goal. It also enables you to make more informed decisions about marketing investment. Um, because if an activity is in the strategy, if it's de developing on those goals, that's something you should be spending money on. Essentially, a good strategy removes guesswork and habit from the marketing mix, and it replaces them with clarity focus and efficiency. It can also be extremely important as your company grows to make sure that you have coordination between internal teams and external agencies and all the various people who are involved in marketing your company. I would say as part of strategy, one thing to watch out for is don't get confused by abstract marketing metrics. This isn't really what I mean by strategy. And I think it's often something that holds people back is that they don't know what the KPI is that they should be setting, like how many website hits should be, we should be looking for, or how many pieces of coverage. Of course, that's part of it in terms of measuring that things are effective, but your strategy is really about your commercial goals. So the, the success goals within your strategy should be about how many sales calls are we getting? How has our revenue increased? Those, those, sort, of, um, those sort of goals. And finally, I think um, this is quite a complex point to try to get across, but with all that possibility that we talked about in the clean tech space, one of the key things that you need to do as a company is to really stand head and shoulders above your competition and really stand out. You simply can't do that if you're marketing, marketing in exactly the same way as your competitors are. Real strategy will come out of a deep understanding of your company. It will help you to shape a unique, unique story and a campaign and marketing approach that will really set you apart. Okay, um, final point, number three, the most exciting one, I think. Uh, become your own media company. So this is expanding on the point I mentioned about content marketing. I was really not a fan of, co of content marketing for a long time. I didn't really understand it. And it can be terrible. So let's be clear. Um, when we talk about content marketing, the, the worst end of content marketing is sort of clickbait, meaningless blog articles like... Um, I don't know, five ways to increase electrical efficiency in your hospital operations. Nine ways to sell a wind farm. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And no one reads these articles. It's just done for SEO purposes. It's really not providing value to your audience. But done right, content marketing can be transformational. 
So let's define what we mean by good content marketing. Very simply, this is about creating original content that crucially is not directly about your business. It is not the same as pure marketing content. The content that you create here must inform, educate, or entertain your audience. The, the, the really important factor here is that it should bring value to your audience first and to you second. And in fact, that value that comes to you can take a long time. It is a long-term game. Content marketing won't deliver immediate results, but over time it can build a large, loyal audience that can be highly valuable to your company. So that's the theory. Um, and now I'll hand over to Adam, who is going to share some case studies with us so that you can see what this looks like in practice. Okay, so Kiwi Grid and Reimagine Energy. So Kiwi Grid is um, uh, an example of a company that has invested in growing up marketing with us. They um, essentially create, have created an internet of energy platform, a shared ecosystem of online energy assets. Their technology is enabling those from disparate industries to join the digital energy revolution, which will, in the long run, make a decentralized energy system possible and less dependent on fossil fuel resources. So, of course, their technology has its USPs. Uh, the company's office and culture have the edge of a Silicon Valley tech firm, transported into a set of sprawling offices in Dresden. Their vision and values are noble and achievable, uh, which is to help businesses succeed in a sustainable energy world. This is all great. However, they have uh, had huge challenges when, um, just like any company would, when it comes to marketing. So, um, some of these challenges are, uh, it's an incredibly crowded marketplace. There are dozens of companies similar to KiwiGrid vying for attention from a limited number of large customers uh, like utilities and OEMs. It's very easy to accidentally say the same thing as your competitors and thereby fail, uh, fail to stand out. Um, another thing is that um, just like a lot of other companies at the moment, you can't rely on traditional PR um, in the same way that you used to be able to. Media are oversaturated with stories, and to guarantee coverage, large project partnerships must be launched or finance rounds announced or extremely surprising and huge sales pulled off. And this sort of news doesn't come around every day. Uh, finally, their, um, audiences, they, all audiences have different habits now when it comes to consuming media. Um, in our research, we found that target customers for our clients aren't necessarily reading the broadsheets anymore or they aren't opening up morning roundup bulletins in their inbox. Most likely they're on LinkedIn or at events or on Twitter. They're everywhere basically, so you can't just focus your communications on one outlet and expect that to go really well. So, uh, knowing these challenges, we proposed an idea to KiwiGrid, uh, which they agreed to, and we've been working on it with them since January, and that was to produce, write, design, and distribute their very own magazine, Reimagine Energy, which you can now see on screen. Here's a terrible photo of me um, reading the magazine at eWorld. I'm not sure how this crept into the slide design. Um, but actually, it was, it was really exciting being there because, um, sorry to use an, an awful cliche, but these magazines were genuinely flying off the shelves. I think it was really noticeable how much the magazine stood out. It really didn't look like a company brochure. It didn't look like marketing material. And I'm sure you've all been to enough trade fairs to know just how saturated it, it can be with that kind of marketing content. This looked different. It looked like editorial content. It, it looked like something that you were getting for free. And I think that's really what, what made uh, people uh, attracted to it. So yeah, it really, uh, I mean, we designed it in order for it to be uh, stylish aesthetically and have, have this premium aesthetic. Um, and so, because we really didn't want it to feel too salesy. The, like, like Alyssa said, the amount of stuff that you're given at trade shows, uh, you can fill up a, a, can, a branded canvas bag with all the bits of paper very easily. So uh, we wanted to create something that um, looked completely different. And in fact, people thought that this was a magazine supplemented by the venue itself. Um, and what this did is that it helped Kiwi Grid stand out as a creative, creative and sophisticated thinker, which obviously reflects how they want to be perceived by their customers too. Um, so what else it's done? It's um, enabled Kiwi Grid to push bigger picture messages all year round rather than relying solely on, their, on this newsworthy PR. Um, they're able to share their own perspective on the energy landscape and shape the conversation rather than follow it. Uh, while at the same time, they can include their own product recommend re recommendations that support those views. So what we're not saying is don't talk about your products ever, but integrate that within a larger story about where the company vision is, um, where the company vision is actually going. 
Um, so finally, uh, all the content that we created for this print magazine at the beginning was, uh, we can really easily repurpose it into digestible and shareable digital, uh, digital content as well. And where that comes in really handy, it's not just to have some more digital noise, it's actually, it makes it really trackable. If you put it on a blog, you can see who's going there and what's working. Uh, you can make it very visible by pushing it through LinkedIn, because obviously that's a really good way to distribute content. And uh, you can make it convertible by including it in their newsletter. So uh, by setting um, targets of how many downloads there are going to be, you can, you can all of a sudden make it um, a real kind of uh, clear figure about what success is going to be. Um, so uh, that's uh, Reimagine Energy. The first edition. I think we've got a question oh. from uh, that Lucy's got for us over here, Adam. Yes. Yeah. So if it's um, unbranded or not really very branded to you, how do you still ensure that it will provide sales? Yeah, good question. And that, that's exactly what Kiwi would ask. <laughs> so um, we, um, of course, we have to ensure that all roads lead back to Kiwi Grid. So as you'll see there, if you go back to the other side of the magazine itself, the front cover looks like this sort of editorial aesthetic. Obviously on the back, we've got contact details for Kiwi Grid. Um, in the edition that we're doing right now, we're going to have sort of product references with, uh, which are going to link to, on the digital version, it's going to link to their website. So we are going to make it really uh, easy to get back to Kiwi Grid, but we're just going to present it in a way that makes it feel like you're telling, they're telling a story about the energy landscape and not about them. So this is going back to Alyssa's point about making the content of value to the reader first rather than the writer. Great question. Thank you. Um, so anyway, before we move on, the first edition of um, Reimagine Energy is available um, from Kiwi Grid's website, uh, which is kiwigrid.com. If you go to their news section, you'll be able to find it there. And uh, keep your eyes peeled for the second edition, the Changemakers edition, which will be coming out in the next few weeks. Um, so yeah, moving on to another of our clients um, who've uh, invested in grown-up marketing. So this is Biome and the campaign Think Bioplastic. And if you know anything about life size media, you will have seen us uh, relentlessly and proudly post uh, some videos and content from the Think Bioplastic campaign. So uh, just a bit of background. Biome is the UK's leading bio-based plastics manufacturer, and um, they have obviously had a really eventful couple of years. Um, the plastic wave has been punctuating environmental media conversations. Um, and of course, this is wonderful news for a clean tech company. It's like, finally, the public is finally aware of what we've been trying to say for years. Um, however, uh, you've got to be careful what you wish for. Um, in such a pandemic, it's incredibly difficult for a company to raise its head above the parapet. Um, and after a few months, the public might become cynical, journalists may be suspicious, uh, stories could stagnate, um, and essentially focus on slowly shifting government policy rather than the hopeful technology solutions that um, our clients essentially provide. Um, and Biome essentially had the same problems as Kiwi Grid. Uh, they're competing in a very busy and vocal marketplace. Um, they had an unwillingness to rely solely on PR and also a knowledge that high value audiences uh, were consuming media online rather than traditionally in print. And you couldn't really tell where everyone was and where you needed to convey your messages. So we developed um, a content strategy for Biome fronted by the educational platform Think Bioplastic. Um, thinkbioplastic.com if you'd like to check it out. Um, and essentially this campaign uses science and facts to show the world that bio-based plastics can contribute to solving the global plastic problem. That's its main message. And the piece of, the, the sort of largest piece of content we did for this was the video mini series, Our Plastic Predicament, which um, hopefully you'll have seen us share a bit. Um, in this, we furnish the audience with easy to understand narratives on why plastic has caused such a problem and what some solutions could be and also what alleged, alleged solutions are actually red herrings. So the pros of this means that it's given Biome a chance to curate and develop their own content and push their own messages, which stands out in a crowded room of plastic stories. So as you can see on screen right now, um, one of the questions that they were frequently asked is what's the difference between biodegradable, non-degradable, oxo-degradable, et cetera. And um, essentially this is, what we've done here, we basically were able to answer all these questions, uh, but in a more approachable way. Um, secondly, um, it's um, enabled them to provide educational resources for all different types of audiences. Um, and uh, what it's done is generated content for the whole year, which like the Kiwi Grid can be repurposed and re-released and cited as examples. And something that we've been doing in every conversation we've had with a journalist with, um, from a buy-in point of view, 
we're able to refer them to the Think Bioplastic resources and website as a kind of external um, idea of uh, the, think the bioplastic story. Um, and finally, um, it speaks volumes. It's enabled Biome to say what it can't through its own channels. We understand that as a company with a board of investors that it's sometimes, you can't always say exactly what you want to. Um, but, you know, for instance, when it's, when, when there's um, such a plastic, a huge plastic problem and you find out that only 9% of all global plastic is recycled, you really want to say that and really want to go into that argument and talk about it. But sometimes as a company, you can't actually do that. So I think bioplastic work really well as a vehicle to say these messages, which are really important and impactful for audiences. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and that was um, a very good way of uh, sharing Bion's message. I think we have a couple of new questions. Okay. Um, one applies both to the Kiwigrid case study and this one. Um, was Biom and Kiwigrid instantly sold on the idea of creating this um, new channel? Or if not, what was the most important thing that made them go for it? That's a really interesting question. I think, um, I would say that I think both companies are um, bold and forward thinking companies and we wouldn't have been able to sort of really raise this this conversation with them if we didn't feel that they were open to new ideas and approaches but in both cases I think it was a long conversation it certainly wasn't something that either of them signed off on overnight I think there was an immediate spark of, of sort of energy and creativity around both the ideas I mean I think everyone immediately liked the idea of the, of the campaigns got excited by them I think that's kind of always a good indicator of that you're you know that you're onto something no one's no one's feeling that about like nine ways to uh, sell a wind farm or whatever whatever it was that adam suggested before and these were these were kind of campaigns that immediately sparked new ideas and actually the resistance sort of came once the campaign idea had been formed and it sort of got to the point of okay are we really going to commit all of our communications activities around this are we really going to commit the resources you know neither of these are sort of um, cheap campaigns, if you like. They both require an upfront investment. And certainly it took some work to then um, to sell the ideas to the, the sort of more senior people who sign off on these ideas. But I think the, all the right thinking was there behind why we were doing this and how it was gonna directly contribute to, um, to the company's goals. And I think if you're, if you're coming from that point of view of serving the commercial goals, then then the campaign will be a success and you can get people uh, bought in on it. Nice. Um, we also have another question from Emma. Um, who creates the content? Is it people from Bion or Kiwigrid's teams or LSM or external? Um, so it's, it's largely uh, led by us, we would like to, you know, we, we work with um, our contacts at the, at the client, whoever it is, um, and try and, you know, have creative brainstorms and present ideas. Um, we work as a team internally uh, to try and have creative brainstorms to try and figure out what the best way to do this is. Um, it is a process where we kind of work with the client alongside each other and then developing and creating the actual content, whether it's design work or film work, that's something that we look after. Um, in-house and we do all of that um, ourselves. But, but it can work both ways, it really depends on what resources you have internally. I think the, the piece that's most important to do with an external agency is really the content strategy. So I think that's, that's often where you need a bit of objectivity, um, you need some external expertise and people who are a little bit further away from Think, thinking through the how are we actually going to produce all of this and get it done on a day-to-day -day basis but if you do have resources internally then of course you could look at um, working with someone externally to help you develop the overall strategy but doing some of the delivery in-house. Nice, we also have a third question. Um, with this kind of campaign, I think Bioplastic, that's involved in such a debate, aren't you a bit of a risk to look like you're lobbying? I think that's a really important question so just to repeat that that's a question where you're doing an educational campaign is, is there a sort of danger is that coming coming across as lobbying I think that's something to be to be very much aware of and something we were really mindful of particularly in producing the think bioplastic videos that we we really needed it to be balanced and I think this is again where understanding your audience is critical and doing proper audience profiling. So we knew that a, a big part of the audience for these videos was going to be the wider scientific and research community. And there was just no way that we could get away with, um, you know, delivering the party line and, and having a sort of huge bias 
towards um, towards compostables. So there was quite a lot of, of, of sort of, of actual research and fact checking that went in to producing these videos that were written by a scientist, um, they were approved by scientists um, at Biome and by third party advisors. There was a lot of upfront work to make sure that this was sort of um, reliable content um, that we could go out with. But I think at the top end, we, you know, the, the clue is in the name. There's, we're quite transparent about why we're producing the content and what the company believes, but certainly once it gets down to the sort of details of the content, that's where we really had to be sort of very, very careful and very factually correct. Great, thank you for those questions. Yeah, just a, a final a final point, point on um, this. So with Think Bioplastic, the results were uh, pretty remarkable. Competitors of Biome were getting in touch, asking to be part of the video series. Um, academic institutions requested to use the videos as an educational resource, and a government program actually shared the content from their own newsletter and channels. Um, and so basically this, this platform can continue to push content in whatever capacity and will always be an additional channel for Biome to use with any of their future messages or routes that it chooses to take. Uh, so what both of these examples show is how these companies have put themselves in a position as publisher and they're able to choose exactly what is distributed from their channels. And this therefore enables them to shape the debate rather than add to it while also setting themselves aside from their competitors as more than just a tech company, but as an organization with a larger vision and wider appeal. Okay, I want to make sure that we um, make time for Q&A and that we don't make you late for um, whatever you have coming up next. So um, let's wrap up everything that we've discussed today in, in just uh, two slides. So very simply, what are clean tech companies to typically doing wrong and what do they need to change to get it right? So, number one, clean tech companies tend to stay in their comfort zone. Number two, uh, they communicate because they feel they have to. Number three, they prioritize what they want to say above what uh, the stakeholders want to hear. There's rarely a defined strategy that's written down. There's uh, no development of that marketing strategy alongside a commercial strategy. And there's simply not enough time, energy, and resource invested into marketing. All right, so what does grown-up marketing look like? First of all, marketing and communications has a seat at the table. Secondly, time is taken to review strategy, benchmark against competitors, and consult with stakeholders. Crucially, communication strategy is written down and committed to by everyone that's involved with your marketing. Four, it can look like creating your own original and entertaining content, if that's the right choice for you. Critically, that content must bring value to your audience. And overall, I really believe that grown-up marketing is about owning and sharing a unique perspective. So very briefly, I just want to mention the strategy work that we described doing for Apple and that elements of which have informed all of the campaigns that you've looked like today. So this is a new product for us, the Life Size Blueprint. It's um, essentially a three month marketing and communications plan. Basically, you come to us with your commercial goals and we'll develop a communications roadmap that will help you get them, basically. <laughs> uh, the blueprint consists of up to 12 chapters. So we've talked about a few of those today, like the stakeholder analysis, competitor benchmarking. Um, it can also consist of developing your key messages, your value proposition, and actually developing the, the plans around brand content and PR that are going to form the, the key components of your communication strategy. The, the real point here is that the blueprint is about deep insight and actionable information. So for each area, you can expect concrete outputs uh, that will support your communications activities. And um, so, yeah, as Alyssa said, we we focus on delivering uh, that straight after um, we've done the strategy. So we're not just going to allow you to do it. We want to we want to we want to help you do that ourselves. Focusing on our um, areas of expertise, which are brand, content, and PR, and usually it's a mixture of the three of them. And it's not just Adam and I here; it's the rest of our beautiful team. Just a reminder that we have offices in both London and Berlin, and that we work with clients right across Europe. Okay, I think that's quite enough from us. Um, Lucy, I believe we have some questions for the Q&A. Yeah, um, so we have one question from Kate. How would a newer and smaller startup decide what path would be best for them? Uh, hello, we're back on, on video. Um, so, sorry Lucy, could you repeat that question for us? Yeah, um, so a question from Kate. 
how would a newer and smaller startup decide what, what path would be best for them? Right, I think that it's important to recognize that uh, the focus for us today has been on those sort of later stage companies and so it's not um it's not an expectation that you're able to do all of that right from the beginning in fact some of the activities that we mentioned don't work for you in the later stages are quite important i think in the earlier stages i i think my my the sort of main piece of advice i would say two things is one the point about having a written communication strategy really can apply from day one it's an area that often feels um, burdensome to companies when you're when you're trying to really get a company off the ground when you're trying to develop a technology it's always the sort of last thing that you think of, of oh, we've got to do this marketing and communications piece if you just take the time up front to sit down as a company and think what do we want communications to achieve for us and write down what you you agree are going to be your key messages and your key activities that really will make all the difference in terms of getting everybody on the same page in terms of getting that focus um, and making the best use of your resources. The second thing I want to say is I would really recommend starting with understanding who your audience is. So really start from the point of who is it that you're trying to influence, to engage with, to connect with, where do you find them and, and really focus your efforts on those channels. So I, for example, um, I think in the early stages, you often find that startups want to sort of somehow be on every channel that they can be, but it's extremely difficult to support that with a small team and limited resources. So perhaps really think about, you know, if you're, if you're a B2C company, then maybe some of the social media like Instagram or Twitter is really going to be effective for you. But for many of us, uh, a platform like LinkedIn is really where businesses, business connections are happening. And it may be the right choice to say, let's focus all of our efforts on on that platform where we really know our audience is rather than trying to, to do everything because I think if you try to do everything, you'll end up doing nothing. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> uh, Lucy, some other questions? Um, as you work with clients across Europe, have you noticed any marketing differences in different countries, i.e. UK, Germany, etc.? Uh, yes, definitely. I think that, um, I mean, sorry, this is gonna be sort of broad generalizations, but I think we do find that um, the German market is more traditional in terms of how marketing is done. And we find there that actually some of the larger companies that we work with can find it quite hard to let go of traditional approaches. I think press releases is a key example of that. So um, we have found with, with, with some clients, and in fact, like I think it's a, a sort of general market thing that the, the press release is really seen as sort of just a core part of how you do business as a larger company. Um, and that a certain amount of regular flow of press releases is sort of, sort of an, an indication that you are a serious business. Um, it's not to completely discredit that. Of course, it's important to have an ongoing dialogue with journalists and press releases can still be very effective if it's the right target audience in terms of the type of media you're sending it to and that the content of the press release is good enough. But um, that's an area where, for example, we're finding that you know you really need to challenge yourself. Is is this good enough content to send to a journalist? Or to put it another way, would it be much more effective just to make a direct approach to a journalist and build a personal relationship with them? So um, I think one of the trends we notice is that the sort of differing degrees of um, tradition versus new methods in terms of marketing activities. Um, is there anything else that you would add to that? I think that um, obviously this is less about marketing activities, but language, uh, language is very different. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I don't speak German, so I don't really know, but I think that in English, there's so many nuanced ways to say things. And um, so uh, the a headline of a press release, you could be working on that for, for days and days but to get it just right. Um, whereas I think in other languages, it would just be far more like you need to go straight into the facts. Whereas, um, so I think language has a, has a huge um, impact on that. I think another interesting um, sort of trend, if you like, that I might mention is that startups from smaller countries or sort of less developed market, markets actually tend to be better at marketing because they know that they have to work that much harder um, to, to sort of get on the international map, if you like. They're sort of aware that they don't have the strength of the market behind them that's going to mean that people are necessarily focusing on, on their country or startups in their country. And so they tend to work that much harder. And I think that's something that we can learn actually from those startups. And um, one final question um, from Warren. It says, great work, thank you. Would you each have a book recommendation, please, on a marketing relevant topic? 
Oh, Warren, what a great question. We're totally unprepared um, for that question. Um, I actually think it's, an, it's a really interesting area that there are not, I don't have immediate recommendations in terms of, of marketing books, actually. There's not, there's not one that immediately springs to mind. Maybe there is a space in the market, Warren, that we should, <laughs> that we should be focusing on. Um, so rather than sort of um, clutch at straws there, I think we're going to have a think about that and um, I'd be more than happy to come come back to you individually um, when, when I can think of, uh, of some good content for you. I think perhaps it might also be, uh, yeah, uh, actually more relevant in, in terms of my mind is thinking of some, some bloggers um, that are writing in this space that I think, uh, and some podcasters that could be useful to you. So happily follow up on that one um, after the webinar. Is that all of our questions, Lucy? Yeah. Great, okay, well, we're just about on time. So um, I think we'll wrap up at this point. Um, Oh, final slide. Um, here are our contact details. Um, of course, if you're interested in working with us um, as a company or discussing the blueprint in more detail, um, and even if you just want to do some absolutely no obligations troubleshooting, please feel free to get in touch to set up a discovery call. We'd be more than happy to talk through what's going on in your business and what kind of challenges that you're facing. Um, also, I know that we have some investors on the webinar with us today um, and some other partners. Uh, we are really excited to be uh, developing partnerships with other companies like us that serve the, the clean tech theme, particularly investors. So if you'd like to talk about how we can work in partnership, we'd be really happy to discuss that with you as well. Um, so I think that's that's all for today. Um, stay dry for those of you in the UK. Um, also, please feel free. This is our first webinar, so we're, we're very open to your feedback and suggestions for future webinars. We'd really uh, appreciate you taking the time and would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.